بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, I am pleased to introduce uh, this morning uh, U.S. time this evening Istanbul time uh, Dr. Hani al uh, a well-known uh, humanitarian icon uh, in the region uh, and uh, founder of uh, Islamic Relief. Uh, he's the head of the Humanitarian Forum uh, in the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and Dr. Hadi Banna has been a very long-term advocate of humanitarian operation, humanitarian uh, work uh, with, with, with uh, not only an, an, an Islamic philosophy, but also um, in, in, in bringing out the uh, essence of um, humanitarian uh, work at a universal stage. Um, I am also, uh, I have the honor also uh, to introduce the uh, Yemen International uh, Development Agency, which is sponsoring this event. Uh, Dr. Hani Al-Banna will discuss, uh, the, the topic is of course, Yemen, the history of Yemen. Um, Yemen and the Arab world, Yemen uh, and the uh, uh, Prophet Sunnah Alayhi Salatu Salam, who are the Yemenis, uh, the Yemenis course. Um, what did Yemeni people do uh, uh, for other nations? Uh, what is the extent of the catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Yemen? And uh, what are some of the solutions? Uh, um, out of this crisis, and uh, his message to the uh, young people of Yemen. Uh, Dr. Hani uh, has very interestingly look, looked into the uh, history of Yemen, the Kingdom of Sheba, uh, history of the independent state, uh, Kingdom of Hadramaut. Uh, I don't want to go into 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 uh, the details of, of his of, of his uh, the essence of his document. But it's a very interesting um, approach uh, for the audience to appreciate uh, who the Yemenis are, what Yemen is, and the place of Yemen. And uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is saying, uh, as of course, uh, the reference of, of Yemen in the Holy Quran. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, uh, ask Dr. Hani to uh, please begin. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Hani, are you muted? Dr. Sotkum, I'm sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 clear. That's fine. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I know that you are talking from Los Angeles, from California, Dr. Hisham, and uh, Ali is in uh, Istanbul, in uh, Konya, and I am in Birmingham, and somebody else somewhere else. So, either good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, or salamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, I've, I'd like to thank, first of all, the young people who helped me to make this uh, event uh, today, which is uh, Ayman Al-Hamadi. Uh, uh, can you go move the slides, please, Brother uh, Ali? 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 I think Ali is probably muted. Uh, doctor. Can you move the slides, please? Hello, uh, I'm trying to thank uh, those young people, uh, all Yemeni from Istanbul and different countries, uh, Muhammad, uh, Suhail, Zakaria, Sha'lan, uh, Ayman Al Hamadi, Ahmed uh, Musanna, and of course Ali Shawa. The five of them are helping us to obtain this valuable information about Yemen and the outcome of the talk today. Uh, today, our talk is something like, uh, we're a little bit upset about how the Yemen has been treated. 
it, this is the way we, as I mentioned before, how to treat our Yemen. When I said our Yemen, it's really our Yemen. Because Yemen is not like any other country. Yemen is a country that has got at least 4,000 years of contribution to humanity and civilization, renaissance, scientific knowledge, uh, others, theology and culture and philosophy and all these sort of things. That's why I myself, as an individual, as a humanitarian worker, is extremely upset extremely upset to see what's happening in Yemen is happening for the last six years. There's five countries on earth uh, have contributed heavily to the development of civilization and the renaissance of humanity. Yemen is one of them, Egypt is the second one, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. They are the source of civilization for humanity. So we cannot afford to see countries like Yemen and Syria are very badly treated like this for the last 10 years in the case of Syria and the last six years in the case of Yemen. As Dr. Hisham mentioned at the beginning, my talk today is about the ugly scar. The ugly scar, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is a very ugly, deep scar on the face of humanity collectively. With this humanity represent Arabs, represent Muslims, represent the international community because will it go to torture more than 24 million people in Yemen who are actually in dire needs of everything. That's why in my uh, uh, discussion today with you, I'm not just going to talk about the, 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 the humanitarian situation of Yemen, but I would like to let you understand with me the value of Yemen and Yemeni as a civilization and the history and culture and scientific knowledge. As Dr. Hisham mentioned at the very beginning, we talk about the history of Yemen, what are the Arabs, Arab Arabs, and the Arab Arabized Arabs, or Arab Al-Arab, or Arab Al-Sa'ariba, and what did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say about Yemen, the Yemeni companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are the Yemeni scholars, uh, what did Yemen do to the, near, the other countries and nations, what's the extent of the situation or crisis, and what's the solution then a message to the young people. So my appeal to you, young men and women today, is for you. This message is for you, is for you exclusively to go for it. Point number one, Yemen history goes back more than 4,000 years ago. It's 2,000 years BC, from 2,000 years BC uh, till the seventh century. And this is what we call it the Sahidi civilization, the Sahidi civilization, okay? and uh, Sahidic civilization, as you can see it on my uh, actually presentation. It goes to six or seven stages. First stage was the kingdom of Sheba, which was nearly 1000 years BC. And the second stage is the independent state, which goes to four or five kingdom. The kingdom of Hadramaut, which started 200 years BC, and in Manfa, and then in Shabwa, and the kingdom of uh, Mu'in, which was in Al-Juf. Uh, can you please, uh, yeah. Uh, Al-Juf, the capital was uh, Manfa, then Shabwa. That is Hadramaut, sorry. Mu'in was in uh, uh, Mu'in, uh, in Al-Juf, 800 years BC, between Hadramaut and Najran. Most people claim that the kingdom was started 1300 uh, BC to 700 BC. The kingdom of uh, Qataban, 500 years BC, in Wadi of, of the Valley of Bihan, 1000 years BC to 25 AD. The kingdom of Kinda, 200, 200 uh, years BC to 633 uh, years AD. Capital is Al Fao village, and King, kingdom of Ausan, 230 uh, or 115 B BC, and between Bihan Valley and Adan. So this is actually the second stage of the history of Yemen as independent states after the kingdom of Sheba. Uh, uh, slides, brother. Uh, uh, stage, number, uh, stage number three is the kingdom of Hamir, which is 115 BC to 2525 uh, AD, the last of the ancient history of Yemen, can uh, uh, Ghafar, Gufar and Jareem. And stage four, which is Al-Habash, which is 525 uh, to 599 AD. 
uh, stage five, uh, Sasanian, which is the Persian, 570 to 599, then the Islamic era, 610 to 1967, then the modern Yemen is 1967 up to now. So what I'm, when I'm talking about Yemen, Yemen as a value of contribution to humanity, it goes 4,000 years. It's not somebody that would like to have a handout or some uh, material aid. No, it's somebody of culture and value and the history and civilization and contribution to humanity. That's how we should respect Yemen and the Yemeni people because of their contribution to humanity, to civilization, to renaissance and to science and technology. This is the history side of Yemen. To understand how we should treat Yemen. We should not treat Yemen like any other uh, area and how we should treat Syria, it has the same dimension like Yemen as well. And this actually, the geographical location of some of these kingdoms and you can see it in Arabic and English as well. This is some of the treasures of Yemen. You can see this in Yarim, this big, huge building on the left, which on your right, it is actually in Yarim. And actually the, the statue is there, invaluable, invaluable, invaluable treasure of Yemen has been shifted and looted and sent to different countries. This reminds me of what has, has been happening to Iraq with the fall of Baghdad in 2003, when some people entered the ancient museum of Baghdad and they were looting and stealing all the invaluable, priceless treasure of Baghdad. And now we can see it in different parts of the world. Be careful of people coming to our country and stealing our treasure and try to claim that this treasure is a part of their history. Please, Yemen is older than many, many, many countries that they claim that the Yemeni are backward when they started their civilization when these countries did not exist before. And this is some of the treasure of Yemen, which could have been stolen and shipped to other parts of the world. The second point I talk about the, the Yaram, Yemen are the origin of the Arabs and the Arabic language. And the Arabs have to pay their debts to the Yemen and the Yemeni people of bringing the Arabic language to them and letting them to understand the language of Quran as well. The Arab Arabs, who are the Arab Arabs? Arab al -Ariba. They are the Qahtani, the descendants of Qahtan ibn Abir ibn Shalikh ibn Arfakhshaz ibn Sam ibn Nuh, the, the son of Noah. Qahtan is the father of Yemen. Qahtan is the father of Yemen and the father of Ya'rub and Ya'rub is the father of the Arabs. So on another way, take it or leave it Believe it or not, the Yemen are the fathers and the origin of Arab and the Arab language. So we all belong to Yemen. Our tribes come from Yemen. The Arabic language came from Yemen because Ismail السلام, did not speak Arabic, but actually he learned it from his wife and his uh, her, her tribe, and he became uh, to make the Arabized Arab as well. So let us say this one. Qahtan is the father of Yemen. And he made his son Ya'rub to rule Yemen after him. Ya'rub was the first one to speak Arabic. The whole peninsula spoke the language later on belongs to Ya'rub. Actually, from there came the Arabic, the world of Arabic language. Uh, the Arabized Arabs, which are actually the Al Arab al-Musta'ariba. Uh, they are the descendants of whom? Of Prophet Ismail السلام, the son of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and his wife, uh, Ramla bint uh, Madad al-Jurhumi from the tribe of Jurhum. Ismail uh, learned the Arabic language from them and started to spread it into the whole Arabian Peninsula. So the favor of Yemeni on all of us is our tongue who speaks Arabic, our history, and our understanding of the source of civilization at the moment, which is the Quran and the knowledge for humanity. So Al Arab Al Ariba and Al Arab Al Musta'ariba. This actually how we should pay our gratitude to the Yemen and the Yemeni and the Arab and the whole fam, the whole Yemeni to bring the Arabic language to our hearts and our mind and our soul to, to let us to understand actually the, the language of Quran as well and the hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, the language of the new civilization as well. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about Yemen? Abu Hurairah. Uh, said that the people of Yemen 
have come to you and they are more gentle, soft hearted or hearted. Belief is Yemenite, Al Iman Yemani, wisdom is Yemenite as well. So Al Iman Yemani, Wal Hikma Yemaniya, Wal Fuk Yemani, Iman is Yemani, uh, wisdom is Yemani, and uh, Fuk is Yemenite as well. This is how the Prophet mentioned this hadith, which is narrated by Al Bukhari. The second hadith, the Imam Muslim uh, narrated uh, uh, the Abu Huraira that the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa sallam, sallam, said, Verily, Allah would make a wind, a wind to blow from the side of Yemen, and this wind would be more delicate than the silk that we have. In Allah, this is the value of Yemen, Iman. And the Manet Iman at that time when the Prophet said, Look at Yemen, Araq Qurban, the most soft hearted in earth of the believers of Muhammad, of, of the message of Muhammad. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira wa Sayyidina Al Imam al Bukhari wa Imam Muslim. On the authority of Abn Umar, also the Prophet said, Allah Mubarak lana fi shamina wa yamanina. Oh, Prophet said, Oh Allah, bless our Yemen and our Sham. That's why I'm saying very adamant, this should not ever and never happen to these two countries. A Sham, which was blessed by the Prophet, which is Syria and the surrounding, and Yemen, which is blessed and was blessed and is still blessed by the Prophet and its people as well. This is how the Prophet ﷺ valued Yemen, valued Sham, and valued the contribution of Yemen, and they knew what Yemen will be doing for humanity in the future, inshallah. Another hadith uh, on the authority of an Ubayy Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amr, radiallahu anhu, may Allah bless them, Prophet ﷺ pointed his hand towards Yemen, and they said, believe is coming from this direction. Belief is come al Iman, al Iman Yaman, al Iman Yaman, al Iman Yaman, and now we are torturing those people that the Prophet mentioned them in his vision in his hadith more than 1400 years ago. والسلام, very, very outrageous for all of us. This is about the number the, the, the hadith mentioned and more hadith. And more hadith actually about the Yemeni and the and people and the Yemenite. In uh, albawaba.com, 25th February 2016, Bab al it said that more than 100 companions of the prophets came from Yemen. This could be more than the number of companions of the prophets came from Mecca. And the distance between Yemen and Mecca, uh, Yemen and Medina, were more, more, more. Uh, uh, longer, much longer than actually the distance between Medina and Mecca. And not only that, Sayyid Tabi'in, the master of all the followers of the followers of the followers of the followers of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu is or was Wais uh, al-Qarni, who was born uh, uh, before the, 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 the message or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi become a, a messenger. And died later on in 37 Hijri in the battlefield of Safin. He was born in Awais uh, al uh, Qarni, in Qarn, in, in Yemen, and died as a martyr in the battlefield of Safin and buried in uh, Al Riqa in uh, Syria. So, what is so good about Sayyidina Awais al Qarni uh, is that actually he said, Prophet said, actually, if you meet Wais al Qarni, please, 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 Omar, Abu Bakr, Ali, Uthman, Aisha, and others, ask Wais to make a dua for you before Allah. This was the value of someone who was there but never met the Prophet, produced as an outcome of the great plea of the soft hearted Yemeni, actually, that the Prophet talked about them. So Sayyid Tabi'in is from Yemen, plus other hundred, hundreds companions of the Prophet like Sayyidina Abu Hubayra, as all of you know it, know him, Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, may Allah be pleased with him, the master of, of nights, <coughs> Sayyidina Ubayy ibn Ka'b, 
the uh, revelation writers said now osama you young people have to know your history know those great names which he mentioned in the history of humanity and made the great contribution to the establishment and the spread and the understanding of islam whether in this area or abroad as actually scholars and that actually and companion of the Prophet. Usama ibn Zayd, may Allah be pleased with him, the most beloved to Prophet Muhammad, Asma bin Ta'amis, may Allah be pleased with her, uh, made Hijra twice, or Juwayriya bint al Harith, uh, one of the, the mothers of the believer, radiallahu anha, Zayd ibn Haritha, may Allah be pleased with him, the adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad, who was martyred in Mu'ta, the battlefield of Mu'ta, and he was, was the leader of the army. Sharhabil or Sharhabil ibn Hasana, may Allah be pleased with him, who conquered, uh, who was the conqueror of Jordan and became the ruler of Palestine. Uh, Al Miqdad ibn Amr al Bahrani al Kandi. May Allah be pleased with him. Actually, uh, the first night among his, the companions, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, uh, as all of you know him, Amr ibn Maadi Karib, may Allah be pleased with him. The night of uh, Jahiliya in Jahiliya and Islam, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, may Allah be pleased with him, the leader of Al Khazraj and the holder of Ansar flag, uh, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, who was buried in Istanbul, uh, Asad ibn Zarara, uh, and uh, him and uh, uh, Zakwan ibn uh, uh, Abd Qais were actually the first two people impressed Islam in Medina. Asma bint Murshid al Harithiya, may Allah please with him, she was a Hadith scholar. Uh, Asma bint Yazid, may Allah be with him, the spokeswoman of, of all the women. Uh, um Hiran bint Malhan, who was the martyr, uh, the sea martyr. Uh, um Ma'bad al Khuzaymiya, al al Khuzaiya, may Allah please with her. The best of those who describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umm Walaqa al Ansariya, may Allah be with her, uh, another martyr, Zayd ibn Thabit, a uh, revelation writer, Mu'ad ibn Amr ibn al Jamuh, may Allah be pleased with him, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, عنه, and al, uh, the Abu uh, Dahdah. Anhu, all those and others. I'm not going to mention all the companions of the Prophet, but this was the contribution of the Yemeni at the very early days of the inception of Islam from the word, uh, re the revelation was revealed on Muhammad. Uh, some scholars from Yemen, one of them, uh, Imam uh, Abdul Razak al Sanani, uh, who was from Himyar and he was a uh, uh, a scholar of fiqh hadith and the date of his birth and death is there. Uh, Queen Arwa, there was two queens ruled Yemen at that time. Queen Sheba, all of us know it, but Queen Arwa bint Ahmad al Salehi, who was actually born in 444 Hijri and died in 532 Hijri. And actually, she was made to be responsible for Yemen, Oman, and India. You can imagine the, the, the wide geographical area that actually Queen Arwa was, was ruling. The historian Abu al-Hassan al-Hamadani as well, who was, uh, was born in Sana'a and died in Rida, and actually was a philosopher, poet, and explorer. Uh, Imam uh, Sharar al-Din ibn Yahya al-Kawkabani was born in 930 and died in uh, 1010 Hijri. All the scholars came from Yemen. All the scholars came from Yemen is, pro, is, is, is producing scholars, all of us. Uh, Faqih Saleh ibn Mahdi al-Muqbil, born in Muqbil, uh, 1637 AD, died in Mecca, 1696 AD. Faqih and poet Muhammad ibn Saleh al-Ansi, died in Al-Ur, uh, 1737, and born in Sana'a. Uh, Faqih Muhammad ibn Ali, Al Shawkani, of course, very well known as scholar, uh, born in 1759 AD, died in 1839 AD. Uh, the Jewish historian Yemeni is uh, Hayim uh, Hapshush, uh, born in 1833, died in 1899. Muhammad ibn Saleh al Masmarani, as well as uh, reciter Muhammad al, al Kariti. Uh, uh, as well.
all those oh there's more to come grand artist of yemen ali al ansi uh, poet uh, abdul wahab abdullah nu'man al fadul uh, also uh, artist muhammad murshid naji uh, revolutionary poet salah uh, sahlul and ayub tarish al absi was still alive all those not they are not all what the yemen produced but there are some of the scholars and the artists and the elite of yemen which have been produced over the last few hundred years and more uh, if you allow uh, me yemen, dr hani if you allow uh, me dr uh, uh, muhammad mahmoud al-zubairi may, may allah be blessed with him head of a revolution and 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 poet as well uh, okay uh, you want to talk about him uh he's he was he was a very famous uh, uh scholar a poet uh, studied in cairo went back to yemen and he led the revolu the, uh, the 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 revolution in 1962 and inspired uh, yemeni revolutionaries thanks I think you're muted, Dr. Varadhania. Yeah, no. Can you hear me now? Yes. Probably. Okay. Uh, migration to East Africa, the first to have migration to East Africa was on the 9th century BC, during Ausan and Sheba Kingdom. Second wave was during the Islamic Khilafah. Okay. Yemeni migrants spread to the whole East African coast, which include uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Somalia, and others, the whole coast. Okay. Third wave is still happening up till now. This is actually to the East Africa and the contribution of the Yemeni to the development of East African countries. Even nowadays, the new president of Tanzania is a Yemeni woman, a descendant of Hadrami, a man who immigrated to Tanzania a long time ago. A Comoros Island, they actually started to migrate to Comoros Island since 14th century and mainly from Hadramaut and the migration to India, East India, which is Kerala. 1,000 years BC, the trade between India and Yemen and the exchange of knowledge civilization between India and Yemen, these old countries, old nations, old civilization, old Renaissance, knowledge, actually 1,000 years BC to Kerala in the southeast of India. Migration to Indonesia as well, actually end of 17th century, and the beginning of 18th century, mainly from Hadramaut. And in Indonesia, there's a lot of family carrying the Yemeni name, where some of them became minister or prime minister uh, in, in this country. Migration to the Gulf countries started in 1932 with the creation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the contribution of Yemen. Listen to this. The contribution of Yemeni who, who migrated to Saudi Arabia or to the Gulf countries in building and reconstructing these countries. So the favor of the Yemeni have done to these countries is immense. When actually this country was trying to stand on its feet and make a, make a, a become a state, a proper state, Yemeni uh, workers, Yemeni thinkers, Yemeni teachers actually were helping in establishing and building this, this country. Migration to Britain, the, the occupation of Britain to Yemen was from 1839 to 1967, but actually the immigration or the migration of the Yemeni to Britain came in the middle of the 20s. and from okay uh, now we're we'll talking about point number seven which is the humanitarian situation in Yemen which is most of you actually are waiting for that most of you are waiting for that all this data I'm having today is from United Nations organization like UN OCHA, UNSCR, WHO, UN OCHA it is the office of coordination of humanitarian response UNSCR, which is the Office of actually High Commission of Refugees, WHO, which is the World Health Organization, and also a report from Islamic League Worldwide in 2021 on the last 10 years of what happened uh, 
uh, this is actually uh, worldwide. Uh, it was about Yemen, not actually about Syria. So it's a mistake, yeah, Ali. We need to, uh, this is the last 10 years of Syria report. It is the last six years of Yemen report. Uh, the general information about Yemen, I will mention this. The number of population in Yemen, according to the census of 2016, is 27,584,000. Uh, the number of twin, uh, the number of people needs, listen to this, needs assistance and protection from the Yemeni, 24 million, which is 87% of the local population of Yemen needs assistance and protection. 13.5 million, which is 49.11%, are living at risk of starvation because of lack of food supply, facing a few acute food insecurity. And those 13.5% could become 16.2 by the end of June if we do not supply them with the proper supply. So they move up from 49% of the population to 59% to of the population by the end of June, well, 16.5 thousand living in a situation like a famine situation, famine situation, famine situation, okay? By end of June, unfortunately, this could go up to 47,000 people, which will be less than 0.2% of the total population of Yemen. Yemen also, Yemen have 2.25 million children, from the age of zero birth to, to 59, five years, month, have acutely malnourished. Acutely malnourished. And they need immediate help, actually, in, in the food supply. And this represents about 8.2% of the total population of Yemen. Four million people internally displaced inside Yemen, between cities and towns and districts and governors. Four, which has 14.55%, and Yemen is still hosting 276,000 people from Somalia and from Ethiopia as refugees inside Yemen. So you can imagine they are suffering, all this, having all this suffering, but they're still hosting nearly 276, 277,000 refugees from Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, UN Bledging Conference was last February was trying to raise 3.8 million, uh, sorry, billion, unfortunately, but it raised 1.7 billion is 44% of what's needed by United Nations organization, which is actually not enough. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, and I pray to Allah that this 44% to 1.7 uh, billion dollars will reach the Yemeni people. Because sometimes governments come in international conferences, work like a bazaar, they put, uh, a pledge, but some of them do not fulfill their pledge uh, uh, later on. This is some of the general information about the general situation of what's happening in Yemen here and there. Food security is number two. This we're talking about the maintenance situation. It's not something that you are. You tell me, I give you five pound to buy a basket or to buy some uh, uh, some some meal. No, it is something. It's a huge issue. Twenty-four million people are suffering, afraid from the protection, lack, lack, lack of protection, and lack of food security and other services. Food security, between January and June, the number of people having food insecurity will be rising for, by 3 million, as I mentioned, from 13.5 to 16.2 million, from 49.1% to 59%, actually. And this, we can call it as a, a, a acute food insecurity, Phase IPC3, phase IPC3. How can we divide this phase, uh, this uh, uh, 16 million? 11 million of them will be in IPC3 case, which is in a crisis situation, in a crisis situation, which this constitute 39.87, nearly 40% of the total population are in IPC3 phase, which is in a crisis situation as food security. Five million, huh? the other five million would be in an emergency. Emergency case uh, phase IPC4, actually, which is 18.12. Uh, uh, yet between the IPC3 and IPC4, it's about nearly 58% of the Yemeni people are between IPC3 a phase IPC3 and IPC4, which is a very critical 
emergency situation. The 16 million, which is talk about nearly 57, 58%, exactly 58% of the Yemeni people. The number of people will be facing catastrophic food insecurity, like famine state, by end of June will be 47%, is less than 2% of the population, which is uh, uh, the phase IPC5. About with IPC3, IPC4, and the IPC5 as well. So this is how, in detail, in a microscopic analysis of the situation, the acute on top of chronic situation of the malnourishment and what the people need in Yemen, you talk about nearly 58% of the country, which is more than 16% or so, uh, 16 million people of the, of the whole country. And you can see, we have, we have heard people are actually cutting the green leaves of the trees and cooking it for their children because there's no food supply because there is no nothing and very very scarce amount of food material and supply coming to the country because of the conflict because of the control of the ports in Aden or in Hadramaut as well and you can see this gentleman with his brother and with his children uh, taking off the leaves to cook it for a meal can you imagine cook it for a meal to eat it and to feed the children and you can see the image of the, the very devastating and hard to breaking uh, 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 images of the little children that we see them. Protection, as I mentioned, 24 million people need protection. And you can see the, the, the agony and the fear and the horror on the face of the children in these images. And this young uh, boy oh, as an amputee which had lost his leg why? Because of that. So everybody is scared because there's no protection. 87% of the population need protection in different areas, not only in Ma'rib, in Ma'rib, in Al Juf, in Adan, in uh, Ta'iz, in uh, Hudayida, in uh, uh, Sana'a, everywhere. This is the protection. And this is the horror and the fear on the faces of the children, as you can see them on the images with you. Uh, next slide, brother Ali. Uh, no. Uh, health, 20 million, which is seven, nearly 73%, needs health assistance of different kind of health assistance. And you can divide them into male, female, boys, girls. It's between the yeah, average 24 to 25% of each category of male and female, and boys and girls as well. One child died every 10 minutes because of treatable diseases. Diseases that we can treat, not diseases that we cannot treat, okay? Uh, health worker density is 10 by 10,000. Health worker means maybe nurses, maybe cleaners, maybe assistant, those actually uh, uh, WHO says actually it's more than 22 percent, I mean, but, but, but 10,000, uh, but actually it is 10, you can imagine 10 health worker for 10,000, yeah, and one for a thousand. What is he or she going to do to the people if they don't have the facilities, if they don't have the, the materials, if they don't have the medicine or the chemicals? A specialist, a specialized uh, health workers density, how much? Less than, less than what? One, uh, 0.1%. Yeah, it is uh, 0.1% per 10,000. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 0.1 per 10,000. Yeah, one per 100,000. One per 100,000, unfortunately. They are the public health workers, doctors, and other non-clinical doctors. So you can imagine one in 100,000, for 100,000. <sighs> Medical clinical doctors, 67, they are available in 67 districts out of 333 districts in less than 20%. What about the 80 percent? There's no clinical medical doctors there. This is how the health situation, when we zoom in, we find horror 
We'll find the horror. We'll find the horror. Yes, the images. If you can look at the images, if you can join the Zoom link, you can see all the images, uh, Brother Najib Ali. Uh, and you can see the children with what you call it marasmus. The child who is having the Genji hair, this is what we call it kwasharkur. I used to study this when I was young medical student, and the other uh, are actually having marasmus, actually, and you can see the bones are coming يعني, very, very clear of the chest, the ribs, and the bellies, and other the marasmus and kwasharkur, which is not in the textbook anymore. So you can join the Zoom link through the Zoom link, Brother Najib uh, Ali. Nutrition, again, go back to nutrition and food, for, for food insecurity. 6.7 million people need treatment to prevent malnutrition. 6.7, which is how much? 20, nearly 25% of the total population needs, needs treatment to prevent malnutrition. 4.7 million have acute need. They have acute need, actually. Okay. Thank you, Brother Najib. 4.7% uh, uh, have acute need, which about 17.1% of total population. Then 3.5% needed treatment for acute malnutrition, 12.73%. When you look at all these, it's horrifying figures. 25, 42, actually nearly 55%. Uh, and these 3.5 million people who need acute malnutrition uh, treatment, 2.3 of them are children. 2.3 million children and, uh, from the, uh, under the age of five and under, uh, which is 8.36% of the total population. Need what? Need, need, need a treatment from acute malnutrition. And 1.2 million pregnant women and lactating women, which is 4.36% of the total population. This is horrifying images and figures, which is lactating women, pregnant women, 2.5 million children actually need treatment to prevent acute malnutrition as well. This is the nutritional side of it, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately. Wash means in our water and sanitation. Water and sanitation, access to safe water is become extremely high priority. Extremely high priority, okay? Yemen has the lowest water per capita globally. It is, it is 150 cubic meter per capita per year. While the people in the Middle East and North Africa uh, they have one to 1,250 cubic meter per capita and globally 7,500 cubic meter per capita. So this is how we see the Yemen and the Yemeni are suffering from what were water poverty, water poverty as well. 15.4 million people of the Yemeni required support to meet the basic water and sanitation this is 56 percent of the whole population 56 percent what are we doing every year we give some sadaqa some zakat and cry sometimes and say oh, we feel pity for them i'm talking about millions of people millions of people millions of people for those six years suffering having the agony having cannot sustain their life, cannot sustain their livelihood, cannot sustain their safety and their protection. Uh, 8.7 million people in acute need of having this wash system to be implemented, to apply to them, just 31% of the total population. This is actually water and sanitation uh, inside Yemen. And you can see the children drinking from anywhere. And this could create what we call it as waterborne diseases, unfortunately, which become more devastating to the children and some may bring some untreatable diseases to the children. This is go to education because when we go move from the food to the health to the uh, what is the 
sanitation, we have to talk about education. The literacy rate in Yemen is uh, very low, and these are the statistics uh, in 2004. The average male and the female uh, in 2004 literacy is about 40 percent in 2000 uh, or 45 percent uh, in 2004. Uh, it was 60 percent illiterate amongst female and 21 percent amongst male. Okay, a percentage of those who can read and write, male and female, is about 30. Uh, 3.6 percent, which actually 41 uh, percent of them uh, are uh, uh, male, and 26 percent are female. The people reach the stage of university education: 3.6 percent uh, male and 1.1 percent uh, uh, female. So this is how the statistic, the statistics does not uh, lie. Statistical data does not, and this come from the Ministry of Education of Yemen, and this is the statistical data 2004, not 2018 or 17 or, or 19, which could be less, of course, unfortunately. Uh, the number of teachers in Yemen in the government sector up to 200,000, 208,000 people, 152,000 are male and 55,000 uh, are female. And in the private sector, 15.9, 16,000 female and 3.5,000 uh, 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 male. And this is actually very little, very little compared with the number of the children that would like to educate. And this is statistical data 2013, 2014, Ministry of Education as well. Uh, these are the number of teachers over the last uh, one, two, three, four, five, six years from 2009 uh, to 2016, which around uh, uh, 2,200 and uh, between 200 and 1,000 to 229,000. And this is uh, from the source of the Ministry of Education as well. And this goes to by districts. If you want to go deep to look at all districts where you came from, you can actually read all this data, which is very analyzed. And thanks for the Ministry of Education of providing us with all this data uh, for you to understand the enormity, the enormity and the gravity of the situation of the humanitarian situation in Yemen, unfortunately. Look at this. This is the education either in the open air with this gentleman sitting on a seat with about 50 or 60 children listening to him. And all these two classes, one in the ground floor of a school, nearly يعني, يعني, uh, partially destroyed. Or the first floor, you can see children on the first floor as well, learning from somebody else. Or the school, which is the, the, the girl is having, you can see the big hole in the wall by a missile which came to the to the, to, to the wall of the of, of the class, or the children who are actually sitting on the floor, reminding us of the children of Africa who have no school sitting under a tree. And this, this, this is because of what? This is because of the destruction of the schools by the war. Solution. Bear with me. The leading crucial role will be based on the contribution of you, young people. I put my trust, I put my weight behind you. The young people have to be in charge, inshallah, and they have to set up the scene and create the roadmaps. You, as young people, have to create your roadmaps. First of all, you have to identify your aim. The aim is to establish peace for one and united Yemen that accommodate everyone. One and united Yemen accommodate everyone. This is number one, them. What's our message as young people? Is Yemen for citizenship, social justice, and Yemen without God? For the three, citizenship for all, social justice for all, and Yemen without God for all of them. 
Number three, what's our mission as young people? The responsibility will be lying on our shoulder. Can you see me? On your shoulder, your shoulder, young people. Uh, is our mission. Our values as young people to put on the table, justice, excellence, equality, and the effective partnership. I have some warnings for all of us. What are these? I am always, from my experience, always scared of foreign aid, because no foreign aid without condition. No foreign aid without condition. If we manage to get foreign aid and minimize the political drive behind it, we might accept it. But I'm always scared because foreign aid is coming from governments and each government will come with its agenda. Or even sometimes some organizations have got their own agenda for the foreign aid, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslim organization. I'm also afraid of affiliation to regional international powers, foreign political parties, sectarian groups, theological or religious movement, and the ethnicities. I'm scared of all this. But you people, young people, have to look down when you sit down together and try to tackle all these problems, and we can help you. But the same, which is forbidden matter, which is haram, is racial, Discrimination, tribalism, politicization, sectarianism, and other divisive elements. When you sit down together, look at these divisive elements and try to treat it. This is before we start to make our roadmap. What's our challenges, young people? First of all, it's if, if there's a peace tomorrow in Yemen, the process of stabilizing the peace would be long and difficult procedures and processes. So it's nothing going to happen overnight. That's number one. Uh, they might, when the peace is, oh, is, is there and there's no war, you might find all the supporters vanishing, خلاص, because once the media is not uh, uh, covering the incident happening in Yemen, those donors will go to another conflict zone. Less or diminishing support. The level of awareness of public, of the people themselves. The level of ignorance among decision makers or leaders. Not all leaders are educated or aware of what's happening. Foreign interest and foreign intervention. And we all know who is who and what they are trying to do to our Yemen. Without mentioning them, because we are not trying to politicize my talk. The presence of the deep state without within the corrupt state uh, 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 in Yemen, unfortunately. It's happening everywhere, not only in Yemen. How to start? On the local ground, the youth with the local organizations and outside by the diaspora community. On national level by local communities, which is local organization, including the young people participation. We, we, we should agree on a clear set of objectives within a planned process inside a simple, clear, and timely roadmap. We should agree, sit down. We don't need to do it on the national level, but even we start on the local, smaller level, on the village level, on the uh, uh, district level, on the uh, residential area level, we have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. No for dependency. Khalas, hand out. We don't want any more hand out. We want to empower the people who are receiving the hand out. Okay? No dependency for uh, dependence syndrome, relying on foreign aid, because those foreign aid create the dependency syndrome which will let the woman and the men sitting at home doing nothing and waiting for the food basket. And this is some of the organization, Muslim organization, organization are falling out and doing that. No for sectarian, religious, theological, political, ethnic, racial, or zonal divide. This actually, when we sit down to create our roadmap, we have to put these things as local organization and involve the young people as well. 
continue the process of communication, never stop communication and with one another. Never ever. Never ever stop communicating with others and building trust. What I can give you my advice, those people who sometimes let you not have internet, not have electricity, uh, shutting down uh, the social media platform in your country, preventing communication happening between you and your colleagues or your neighbor or your country uh, uh, fellow because they don't want you to work collectively and they want to hide the truth from you. So communication, communication, communication is a necessity, an absolute necessity. Agreeing on common principles, even if very few, start to build the roadmap from the village level to the country level, from the street level to the country level. But agree on something. Don't sit down doing nothing. Don't sit down doing nothing. Don't sit down, keep blaming others. I can do something. Even on the street level, on the village level, or the residential area level, I can do anything. But don't sit down doing nothing. Creating specialized committees from the street level to the national level on humanitarian, social, economical, security, guidelines, public awareness, public health, and other services. You have to look at your area where that needs all these services, and you create these committees from among us, you young people inside Yemen. Professor Hassan did not say that the Yemeni people are wise, or the Yemeni people are soft-hearted, or the Yemeni people have vision and wisdom. No, of nothing. You have this, but believe in yourself and trust your colleague, and trust your neighbor, and trust your fellow citizen. Number seven, avoid conflicting with traditional political and community leadership. Number eight, benefiting from social media and communication technology internally and externally, as well as having alternative way when this sort of uh, uh, technology is not available, you have to go back to the very traditional way of communication. To the very traditional way of communication because it might not be a, might not have electricity, might not have internet, might not have WhatsApp working, might not have uh, a Facebook working. We have to go back to actually to our local, actually a traditional uh, way of communication. So we have to balance between both of them, young people, and you are motivative and innovative. Number nine, there should be a transitional period. During this, we might. I'm just saying, going to say something which might shock you. you. Might say you would have to stop the university education for a year or two or three and let the university student go and help, help, help on the social ground, male and female. During this traditional transition, we might stop the traditional education uh, for security reasons uh, or lack of resources and engaging the young people in specialized committee, but we can use the abundant spaces in the religious institution for primary education. What I'm saying here, if there is not going to be education for a year or two or whatever it is, because of this reason, security, lack of security, lack of funding and others, and we're going to use this uh, a university student, let us look at the mosques. The mosques have got huge, spaces could be utilized to become to become uh, classes for the children and to keep teaching the children inside the mosque because how many times you go to the mosque to pray five times for how many hours but at the rest the space is empty so we have to utilize the spaces inside the mosque and use them as classes because what we have seen and the previous images, you see, look at these classes. I put it back again. I put it back again. But we have mosques, thousands of mosques in different uh, governments, and we can utilize them to make them school classes as well. 
Number 10, we have to focus on delivering social and community service, like what? Like health, as young people, agriculture and animal husbandry, and in particularly cultivating alternative products to a cart, because cart brings a lot of money. People might tell you, I'm going to still uh, use to, to, to cultivate cart, and it, it consumes a lot of air, the deep water in, in, in Yemen. Building and managing local community markets, very simple ones to get the economy growing from bottom up. Uh, property uh, properties reconstruction rehabilitation program with the local materials. Building psychosocial support scheme through visiting families. How who should visiting family in this conservative uh, 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 country? It is the young university female will be able to visit the family and to assure the woman and the children there. Uh, bring, bring, building psychosocial support scheme through visiting families and providing them with moral support. This should be led uh, by the young woman. Watching over movement and arrival and security. And if you are in, uh, living in one area and you know who is, who, is, who is the strangers coming to you to do some terrorist activities uh, to your area. Uh, no harm of stopping, as I mentioned, stopping secondary or actually university education during this period to utilize the students' uh, uh, energies on our social program. And this all suggestion, by the way, is all suggestion. Nothing is Quran. Prioritizing uh, manual and handicraft as a function, uh, building our social infrastructure from grassroots up level. Uh, do not be distracted by the donors' promises because as as I mentioned in this uh, pledging conference uh, two months ago, actually the United Nations won 3.8 billion, but unfortunately the donors actually gave them pledged, not give 1.7 billion, which actually is than 45% of what Yemen needs. Uh, only accept foreign donation if they were supporting the principles of a roadmap created by local communities, continuously building the trust and fighting dubious new rumors created by corrupt deep states and counter revolution. How? By communication. How? By communication. How? By communication. Communication is the first step of building trust, then communication, networking, bridge building, partnership, and trust building. This is actually for the young people and the local organization inside Yemen, where yesterday, two days ago, when we did the Arabic one, uh, I remember uh, Hadi Ben Jabir said that we have more than 18,000 local civil society organizations registered there, but we need to activate them. The role of young people, the diaspora outside, you have a role. Those people who are watching me in, in UK, in America, in any part of the world, they have to do this. Exploring different ways of fundraising to support the local community, number one. Number two, promoting and highlighting the grave humanitarian situation of the Yemeni people, number two. Number three, advocating for the rights of Yemeni people to live in peace and end the war. Number four is advocating for peace for Yemen. Number five, networking, communication, bridging the gaps, building partnership, coalition with other relevant organizations to support Yemen outside the country. Okay. Number six, using the technology and the experience, uh, uh, technology and the experience transfer to the local community. And I'm living in UK, in America, in Germany, in, uh, in uh, France, in, in uh, Holland. I have to make this kind of uh, uh, technology and the information uh, transferred to the local community in Yemen. Building multiple stages, roadmaps, as I mentioned before, with their colleagues in Yemen. So you have this kind of communication between the diaspora community and the local community in Yemen. Training and building the capacity of local organization as well as civil servants in the government themselves. Uh, producing research studies and situation analysis on Yemen with different academic research institution and universities. And number 10, securing scholarship for the young university graduates for of Yemen. This kind, this is actually the package for the diaspora community outside Yemen itself, whether they're in the Middle East, in Europe, 
in Asia, in East Africa, West Africa, Latin America, or uh, USA or uh, Canada. My final uh, contribution or to you is to young people, my message, I always, every time I talk, I deliver a message at the end to you young people and they trust you and they believe you and they will stand behind you and your shadow will be covering me forever inshallah because I am decaying and you are rising. I am sitting and you are shining. You got it? You shine like sun and they sit like actually uh, my time is up, inshallah. We have discussed what happened to our be beloved Yemen. It is my Yemen. Tell, let me know. I was discussing this with some Yemeni brothers a few days ago. Said, I am Yemen. I believe in Yemen. I believe in the culture of Yemen, the history of Yemen, civilization of Yemen, the contribution of Yemen, what they have done to humanity before those new countries came out. What they have done, great civilization. And they have to stand for them and for the suffering. We learn from their agony. We thrive on their agony because our organization raising the money and claiming that we want to help we really need to help. Help is feeling, not just giving a hand out. Help is a dream at the back of the mind of the individual like yourself and myself, which does not let us to sleep, let us to have sleepless nights, to think about solution and about finding a way for those people who are suffering because they are tortured. They have, they have, not, they have done nothing wrong. But the sky is bombarding missiles and bombs from hellfire. Our crucial role as young people is multidimensional. Listen, multidimensional. It's central or axial, crosswise, major, complementarily, basic and essential, futuristic, commanding and leading. To build Yemen without God. Yemen for everyone. Social justice for everyone in Yemen. Okay. Let us talk about one of them. Being pivotal, crosswise, crossing means. What does it mean? Our work as young people is over, should be overlapping and engaging with all social problems facing Yemen. In water, health, sanitation, food security protection, education, and all, livelihood and all. So our work should be covering our cross-cutting with all of them. It's number one. Working hard to face these problems and finding effective solution for them. This is the responsibility. Clear for us, young people, it's clear for us. It's not a sightseeing message. It's not some photograph we take and talk about it in meetings or in, 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 as amusing ourselves. Oh my God, I feel pity. No, I feel pity for you because you cannot stand to the standard of the patience and perseverance of the many people who are suffering and still alive and have hope to come out of their agony. This is crosswise. Being central, what does it mean? We will become the initiative creators. You, as young people, you create the initiatives. You take the lead of it, take hold of it, okay? And you will lead the initiative to serve our people in Yemen. This is our role, to be initiative creator and leading it to save and serve the community. Being complementary means we'll complement the roles played by every one. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to see who is playing this role in our area, on the residential area, on the street level, on the village level, on the district level, or on the uh, uh, city level, and to complement, and to keep complementing our, with them, okay? 
then between ourselves and other Yemeni partners in Yemen, then with Yemen diaspora, then with those partners who love Yemen and whatever it is. So keep complementing your role with other roles. Being basic and essential, what does it mean? Will be emerging. Will be emerging from our profound belief in the right of every creation in Yemen to live. We are those who stay up to serve human, serve all creation of God, animal, birds, and inanimate. Stay up to protect cultures, values, manners, history, religions, civilization, science, and technology. And this hour uh, being actually, look at actually the basic needs for the uh, uh, citizens themselves or society. Next slide, please. Next slide. Ali? Ali? Uh, Ali, are you there? Being futuristic, yeah, and look at the future. How to see the future? We should see the future in the eyes of every Yemeni. Suffered, but managed to become patient. There was distressed, but accomplished his mission or her mission. Was deprived by but gave others. Blocked but bestowed, and he gave their zakah and their contribution and their advice to others. Was oppressed but adjusted the community. Was fallen but fixed the community. Made dead by invigorating. Satisfied but gratified. Thanked but praised. Being pure but command but commend uh no 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 can can um, i didn't finish can you bring it back ali ali uh being pure but commend ruled but be to be ruled hurt but forgive permitted but directed Loved but sacrificed, prostrated but being aware, worshipped to, to satisfy, and died but made others happy. This is our future, and this is what can we see the result of the agony in the eyes of the Yemeni people. And they are doing that to all of us. And we are talking about them, but we need to act, not to talk. How to become leading and commanding young people? It means leadership in fairness, consciousness in wisdom, spending in humility, risking but knowing, sacrificing in certainty, leniency in firmness, vision in insightfulness, tranquility in peacefulness, Safety in clemency, hearing and knowledge, consideration in friendlessness, disdainfulness in honor, chivalry in help, determination in craving, clarity in serenity, altruism in generosity, glory in firmament, eternity in the hearts, and sublimity in remembrance this is how to become a leader some of the characteristic of all of you when you take the leadership to end we mourn to make yemen happy we live to make yemen unique we remain to guide and correct yemen and germany we strive to excellently elevate yemen we prostrate to make Yemen magnificent. And this is our message to the young people, which all of you, you should do better than somebody like myself or somebody like Dr. Hisham and somebody else who's actually trying to pass this message to all of you because we have all our trust and hope in all of you. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Hani, for this very inspiring message uh, <clears throat> to uh, Muslims in general, humanitarians, and young Yemenis in particular, particularly in the diaspora. I can attest that a number of uh, young men and women in America uh, no longer have um, a slightest idea of the history of Yemen, what Yemen represents, the treasures Yemen offer, the beautiful history and the uh, reflected in the Quran as well as the Sunnah of the Yemeni uh, people, the Sahabas and, and the, the, the participants in the expeditions. So thank you very much. Um, I did ask for questions through the chat. If anybody has a question for Dr. Hani, he's more than willing to uh, respond. Um, so please, yes, um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask it now. We will allow, you know, from five to seven minutes. If not, uh, thank you very much. Um, we hope the information, uh, the presentation will be echoed through uh, action, through, I, I put a suggestion, for example, on the issue of uh, stolen Yemeni cultural heritage artifacts. And I'm suggesting that a group be created to follow this up. We know the recent news of a very important uh, piece of cultural artifact that was in the Paris Museum, traced to a, a uh, one of the wealthy emirs in the GCC countries uh, that was sold. We need to follow up. We need to uh, communicate to museums, UNESCO and the international humanitarian community to restore Yemeni's artifacts. We need to believe in ourselves. Um, we can stand up, we can, we can, we can rebounce and, 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 and make Yemen great again, but we have to believe in ourselves. So thank you very much, Dr. Hani, for that inspiration message for the uh, detailed humanitarian situation. And like I said, I hope this information is reflected uh, in, our, in our response and our positive action. So with that, we will end this. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, please do uh, raise them now. If not, we will, we will close. Um, yeah, I also um, sent a link to a very interesting piece of information that uh, a vessel back in 1659 was carrying Yemeni silver, gold and silver that was imprinted in Yemen. It was being brought back by an Indian uh, king uh, coming back from Hajj. And that vessel was inter in in intercepted by a, a British pirate who uh, attacked the ship, killed the men, uh, and stole millions of dollars with artifacts that were brought to the US. Uh, some of those uh, pieces were discovered in Rhode Island as well as Virginia uh, with the uh, Yemen uh, imprinted on them in Arabic. So it's very interesting. It's not just during the Sahaba. It's uh, even going back to, to way before that. Uh, the, 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 what Yemen has represented. I also made reference to the word maka, which is used for trading international coffee. And that word goes back to al maka which is a very important and well-known port in Yemen, where coffee was exported to Colombia. So there is a lot more to know about Yemen, to be proud of uh, Yemen, uh, but that requires work, that requires research, and that requires uh, a sense of, of initiative in all of us. So thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Dr. Hani, any final comments? Dr. Hani, I think you're muted. I see we have a comment here. Many people are becoming very delusioned by the ever-increasing number of charities popping up every day who are raising funds for the needy. Does Dr. Hani have any thoughts on this? So you're talking uh, about accountability. I, I'm going to talk about it next Tuesday. 
because okay. I made a special uh, reference to this. Anyway, brother, you have the right to ask any question to any organization. We cannot stop anybody from registering an organization for any issue. But what we can do as an accountability, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Hisham, uh, is to look at the history of the organization. Look at who is the board, like the chairman, the member of the board of trustees, who are the executives. Look at the financial report, actually, to look at who is the auditor. Look at who is the executives and all the history and actually uh, integrity and credibility of the organization before, before actually giving any money to them. And do the search before you pay any money. Do the search before paying any money. And don't listen to organization telling you that I'm the first, or I'm the only, or I'm the best, or I'm the one who does not take any admin cost. Don't trust them. And take it from me. And if any of these organizations would like to come and talk to me, please, they can see me around. Nothing called to be I'm the best. Nothing called to be I'm the best at the first. Nothing to call me no admin cost. Please, brothers, you have the right to ask questions before giving any money. Don't say that you have 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000 or whatever it is. You can't stop it. But you have to give your money to the organization who is credible and integral and have the criteria, financial report, audit report, uh, good go governance body, have this kind of humanitarian standard like impartiality, like uh, impartiality, transparency, uh, uh, what is the other one? Uh, quite a few. Independence, yeah. Independence mm -hmm. and all these sort of things. And don't be taken by emotional messages coming on videos. No, no, no. Be meticulous in finding what is the organization about and especially its history. If I may add, Dr. Hani, uh, yes, I think sir. It's, it's also extremely important not to base decisions on rumors. Uh, and be careful. Uh, it's yes. it's important to ask for accountability, to ask questions, That's but right. be, be be careful. Yeah, It's extremely important to 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 investigate and find out the truth. That's right. Thank you. I believe with that, uh, where it's a concern, I have another comment here. The concern is that this will lead to donor malaise, many or, okay, I, I, that, that issue has been addressed, absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Brother Ali, I believe we can, we can close. Um, and uh, yeah, I welcome, I invite everyone to also attend Dr. Hani's uh, uh, talk on Tuesday. Dr. Hani, could you say a couple of sentences about this upcoming talk? <laughs> I'm preparing two talks. Next Tuesday and next Thursday, uh, sorry, next Tuesday, Friday, is about uh, these questions. What mm -hmm. you, what, yani, to whom you give your money, especially nice. in Ramadan, where there will be a market, like uh, uh, like the souk of the, the market of Uqaz. Everybody come to the market and sing and dance. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm putting about 18 or 17 points of to whom you give, or to whom you don't give. And this will be on Tuesday, 6 o'clock uh, UK time, inshallah, in Arabic. And I think Friday or Thursday, Brother Ali, uh, in English, inshallah. So in these two, inshallah. And actually, the one after that, I'll talk about how to spend zakat. Because there's a new fiqh coming out, Brother Hisham, is saying zakat only should be spent in the locality. And what I'm saying, of course, it's one of the criteria. But if you are living in a very rich country, like if you're in the state, okay, for instance, and the state itself providing social service to its people. So why should I spend 100% of zakat in the state or in UK and not to look at the 800 million people who are actually under poverty level globally? I can divide the, my share of zakat the major, the, major, the major part of it should be spent outside, and some of it will be spent on the local ground. And this will be the second talk uh, the week after, inshallah. Because in <laughs> Ramadan, there will be a plethora of appeals confusing people, as the brother was saying. As brother Shasham 
Hashem, sorry, Hashem said, be make them accountable to your question. And you don't have to donate your money like this. No, ask and ask and ask and ask, then decide. Then after you give the money, ask for the report as well. <clears throat> okay, I believe with this uh, we close. It's been an hour and 26 minutes. Zakhwallah khair. Uh, everyone, you have a good evening where you are. And uh, it's the beginning of noon in the US, California. Good luck for you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa sharam barak al-jami'a, inshallah. 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 Inshallah.